the first topic that we need to look at in John Normandy is John's fighting to secure the inheritance, the way that he fights with Philip and Arthur to get recognition that he is his brother Richard's heir. And so in April 1199, Richard the Lionheart, the opposite of everything that John supposedly is, Richard, of course, remember, Richard the Lionheart is a successful, feared military leader and crusader, dies. On his deathbed, he names his successor as John. And that's important because actually it's not clear who should take over because Richard has died childless. One chronicler actually says that John inherits in inauspicious circumstances. That means that things are stacked against him and they are. Because in different parts of the Angevin Empire, the Angevin Empire, by the way, is England and the bits of France they rule. That bits of France are orange on this map. The traditions in each of these places are different about who in this situation should inherit. If somebody dies childless, who should inherit? Now, in England, in the previous king before Richard, Henry II, that jo that's John and Richard's dad, the justiciar had actually looked at a situation like this and said, if somebody dies, who should inherit? Should it be a younger brother or should it be a nephew? And this previous justiciar in Henry II's reign actually said, after exploring both sides, said the stronger case was with the nephew, was with, in this case, Arthur. Even, and actually, even though by the time of Richard's death, legal opinion has gone more towards actually the younger brother inheriting, it's clear that actually this is not completely accepted, that it's something that's becoming, that's becoming actually um, a, a more recent idea, that not everybody has accepted it. So even in England, the place that's often seen as being John's greatest supporter in his fight to secure his inheritance, it's not completely clear. In France, well, there's different traditions in the Angevin Empire. In Normandy, um, legal documents talk about in this situation, the younger brother inherits. So in Normandy, it's clear that the successor to Richard, the King of England, okay, and the Duke of Normandy, and all the other titles he's got in France, should be John. In Anjou, Maine, and Terrain, which is to the south of Normandy, well, the tradition is different. In those places, the tradition actually usually is that the nephew should inherit. And so you can see why actually it talks about that um, John inherits in inauspicious circumstances, because it's not clear who's going to take over. What matters is actually who can get the most support out quickly and force the other one to back down on the battlefield if necessary. And it is stacked against John in April 1199 because Arthur has already been promised the crown. In the Treaty of Messina in 1191, Richard says that if he dies without a child, his successor should be Arthur. Richard dies without a child. All of his elder brothers are dead. His last living brother is his younger brother, John. His elder brothers have all died without children, apart from his older brother, Geoffrey, who has been given the title Duke of Brittany. And Geoffrey's son is this 12-year-old Arthur, who is the Duke of Brittany. And he's been promised the crown in 1191. And the reason why people think that John is having in inauspicious circumstances is because quite quickly... Brittany supports his case to inherit. Because of the fact the traditions say that the nephew inherits not the younger brother, Anjou, Maine and Touraine, they side with Arthur quite quickly. And Arthur gets the support of Philip. Because once he gets the um, homage of uh, Maine, Touraine and Anjou, he then gives his homage to Philip, that he holds these lands from him. And Philip sees Arthur as being his way to actually oust British, well, sorry, not as British, as English control of France to get rid of the Angevin Empire. That's the bit of France, okay, that's ruled by England, the bit in orange. And so you can see why 
a contemporary chronicler says that John inherits in auspicious circumstances that actually Arthur's got Philip support. Philip, who's a very powerful and experienced commander. He's got the support of barons in Anjou, Maine and Terrain. He's got the support of Brittany. And this is dividing his land in two. That you've got Normandy in the north and you've got the lands in the south that include Aquitaine that's ruled by his uh, John's mother. John, he hasn't actually been sat there doing anything. He's quite busy too. When he actually hears of Richard's death in April 1199, he's actually stopping with Arthur. And he rides off secretly with his closest advisors. And he gives message to, oh well, he gives orders to William Marshall. That's William the Marshall, the commander of his forces, uh, the Earl of Pembroke, and also the greatest knight, to go to England with Hubert Walter, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's also the Chancellor, to meet the barons to try and see if he can persuade or they can persuade the barons to support John because he wants to make sure that England the English barons support him when William the Marshal William Marshall the Earl of Pembroke and Hubert Walter the Archbishop of Canterbury get to England they uh, work with Geoffrey Fitzpeter the Justiciar. I remember the Justiciar is the person who actually rules the country in the king's absence and they call a meeting of the English barons they meet them in Northampton and they persuade them after um, quite a bit of persuasion to support John that they accept that John is going to be the next king of England his successor to Richard and what gets them to do this is they make two promises on John's behalf. One promise is that John agrees that he will listen to their concerns because they're not happy about um, ways that their power has been limited under previous kings. And, and so they promise William Marshall and Hubert Walter and Jeff Fitzpeter promise that John will listen to their concerns. And that also John promises not to himself challenge their power because they promise that he will respect the liberties given to the barons by previous kings. He also at the same time sends, um, John sends useless diversity to Scotland to make sure this King of Scotland doesn't get involved in the situation. Whilst that's happening, so whilst John is very cleverly making sure that England's on his side, he then actually wants to make sure that he's got um, a firewall, okay, that he's got a way of stopping um, Arthur moving into Normandy. So he takes control of the Loire Valley, okay, which is, a, which is a river valley which is important for communication. He takes control of the castle of Chinon and Lausch. And once he's done that, he then actually um, also goes and um, takes an army to Le Mans and goes, over, uh, go, go, and goes there as well. So what he's doing, he's actually trying to get control of the main, uh, main routes across so that actually they're not going to be able to go into Normandy. But unfortunately, John slightly loses the uh, momentum in his campaign at this point. Uh, Philip and Arthur do a joint attack. Arthur, with his mother Constance, they attack from Brittany and they attack east to Angers. Philip leads an army from his land, which is blue on the map west going taking Le Mans and Tours. Le Mans lets him in without a fight and so they divide the land in two. John realises that now's the time to pull back, consolidate his forces and then wait and so he rather than fighting them he pulls his, his forces back and he retreats to the, to the relative safety of Normandy. Whilst there he makes sure that actually he gets control of Normandy so he's invested the Duke of Normandy in April 1199 so all this happens in one month once he's done that he then actually leads a quick raid out to Le Mans and so whilst the army of Philip is marching around and whilst the army of Arthur is marching around Argument terrain going around establishing their authority he leads an army very quickly, a rapid attack down to Le Mans. And when they get to Le Mans, um, they besiege the town, they get in, they destroy the town walls, they destroy the castle, and they kidnap the leading men of the town. As a punishment, as a message, you do not let Arthur, well, let Philip in, in this case, without a fight. Okay, so he's sending a message to um, the people of uh, his lands in France. You do not let Philip 
in if you do i'll punish you and he's also sending a message to philip you might think you've got control of this region but i can still come in and do these attacks once he's done that he then retreats back to the relative safety of normandy and he then gets a marie of thoise who is his who, who he names as his saint charles of anjou Okay, so he names Amy Thoise, he's Saint-Charles of Anjou. Saint-Charles means military commander. He, he, he leaves Amy Thoise, Saint-Charles of Anjou, to lead another attack on Arthur at Tours. So they're going to go down to Tours and try to kidnap Arthur. Whilst that's happening, John then goes to England. He's crowned the King of England in May 1199. He gets the homage of the leading barons. He gets support from the barons for um, his defence of the lands in France. And then he comes back to France knowing that he's got England on his side, knowing that he's actually invested as Duke of Brittany and that he's got the support of England. Just before he lands, his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who is a very feisty, respected ruler who rules the southern lands of the Angevin Empire. Okay, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who holds the lands in her right. She actually has an army led by the feared and respected mercenary captain Macardier to Anjou. So an army marches from Aquitaine um, up into Anjou. That actually then starts to push Philip. And so you've got the situation that you've got um, Aimer Thouars is leading these raids from Normandy into Anjou Mount Terrain. You've got Eleanor of Aquitaine's forces are coming up. And it comes to a situation that actually Philip realises that he needs to stop because he's been attacked potentially on two fronts. And so Philip and John reach a truce in 1199. And this truce is for two months. The terms of the truce are, well, it's just a pause, but it's an important pause. John uses the time to actually go around and persuade people to support him. One of the ways that he does it is through bribery. He pays them to do it. Another way that he does it is that actually he uses the fact that people think that Philip has been unfair. At the truce in June 1199, Philip says to John that if he wants the fighting to permanently stop, he's got to give Arthur, not just Brittany, but he's got to give Arthur Anjou, Maine and Terrain, and that he won't have any control of it. To John, this is too much. There's no concession there. John was to John would not get anything out of it. And so a lot of the barons think that actually Philip is not being fair about it. So that actually helps John to get the support. So he uses the truce, the two month truce in June to get support of the barons by bribes and to get support of the barons by actually saying, look, Philip is being unfair. Also during the truce, John's mom, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who, who actually um, holds her lands from Philip herself, she does something that's very clever. She pays homage to Philip as her overlord. She goes to Philip, she renews that actually Philip is her overlord for Aquitaine in July 1199. And that's clever because that actually means that Philip cannot take Aquitaine off her. She then gives Poitou to John. She then says that actually John is in charge of Poitou. He's the Count of Poitou, and he holds that land from, from me. And so actually, Philip is Eleanor's overlord. Eleanor is now John's overlord. But, but, and then John says that he wants Poitou rule for him by Eleanor. Why this is important is because what it actually means is, is that John can't, sorry, Philip can't take Aquitaine off Eleanor. And that actually, um, Eleanor is ensured that John has got control of some land as well, but actually um, that John is safe as well. So it's, so it's shoring up the bits of land that Poitou, the important bit of land that is between um, Normandy and, sorry, not between Normandy, the important bit of land that is between Arjun Mountain Terrain and uh, the rest of the um, 
Duchy of Aquitaine, he's got control of it because that's a really important bit of land. Once the war restarts, after the truce finishes in August 1199, John has got the upper hand. He's used his time well. So he actually starts to lead an army, pushes out of Normandy, and he's breaking down and he's heading into Philip's, um, well, heading into the land that Philip wants in Argeau, Maine, and Terrain, and he's pushing down, pushing towards Poitou. Philip chases after him. Philip's following him along, trying to keep up. Philip has got with him the previous Saint-Charles of Anjou. The Saint-Charles of Anjou under Richard's reign. Because remember, Anjou main terrain, the barons there have given their allegiance to Arthur. One of those barons is the Saint-Charles of Anjou. It's the Saint-Charles of Anjou under Richard, a man called William de Roche. He's with him. And William de Roche is with Arthur as he's following John. And when they come to a castle at Ballon, B-A-L-L-O-N, Philip makes a rare mistake. Philip, at this castle, decides he's going to raise it to the ground. William de Roche, the Saint-Charles of Anjou, says, well, hang on, that, that castle um, I want, that castle uh, I've got a claim to, please don't destroy it, I actually want to see if I can get that castle. Philip ignores him. He doesn't listen to him. He has it destroyed. And this allegedly is a reason why William de Roche, the Saint-Charles of Anjou, switches. He switches sides from Philip to John. Historians also say that it's not just the decision of Philip to um, raise to the ground the castle at Ballon that William de Roche wants. That actually also uh, William de Roche um, switched sides because there'd been negotiations happening. Um, because actually William de Roche realised that John was uh, militarily having the upper hand. Um, and that he switched sides in return for being the Saint-Charles of Anjou. And he's going to get control of the town of Le Mans. That he's going to keep his job and he's going to get this town. But for whatever reason he switches sides, be it the castle at Ballon being raised to the ground that he wants. And his views are ignored. Or for the fact that actually he says you, I'll keep, you can keep your job as Saint-Charles. Um, or for the you'll get this town. For whatever reason he switches sides, it's important. Because actually William de Roche has been, uh, is the person who's protecting Arthur and his mother Constance for Philip. And when he switches sides, he, he basically has got them with him and he forces them to reach a truce with John. And Philip reached a truce with John in January 1200. John then leaves France, he then goes to England, he then goes around and he tours different parts of England very quickly and he manages to get the allegiance of as many barons as he can to him so they agree that they will, uh, well they accept John as their overlord and he's their king of England and he goes around he makes himself known and then he comes back to France to actually agree the peace treaty with Philip at La Galette in May 1200. Now the peace treaty of, of, of La Galette can be spun a number of ways. On one hand, you can actually say that for John, this was a victory. That he was accepted, despite quite significant odds, because bearing in mind that Arthur is supported by Philip, Arthur is supported by barons in Anjou, Maine and Terrain and Brittany, Arthur has got tradition in some respects on his side. That actually John, he's accepted as the king. And that actually this is a victory for John. That the 33 year old has defeated the 12 year old against all the odds. But the other way you could spin it is that actually John has to give a lot of concessions as well. He has to pay 20,000 marks as a relief, a re uh, as a payment to inherit. So he agrees that he will pay 20,000 marks to inherit the Angevin lands. That's all the bits, all the bits in orange. 
He also says he's going to lose parts of Normandy. Because by and large, he doesn't lose much land. But what he does lose is he loses parts of Normandy. He loses Vexin, which is an area of Normandy that's very important. The only place in Vexin that he doesn't lose on the Treaty of Lecolette is the town of Las Andalies. Les Andalies is where Chateau Gaillard is. Apart from that, the other bits of the area, he loses to Philip. That's important because that gives Philip a foothold in Normandy and it puts him incredibly close to Chateau Gaillard. Another reason why you could say that actually the Treaty of La Galette in May 1200 is um, a... But it has more negatives, you could say, for John, is that he loses the allegiance, or he has to give up the allegiance, of uh, the Count of Boulogne and the Count of Flanders. These two counts were important to John in actually pushing Philip back because during the truce that happens in June 1199, during that two month truce in June 1199, John gets the support of the Count of Flanders and the Count of Boulogne. They're quite important because they actually protect uh, and they stop Philip from attacking uh, the northeastern side of Normandy. And they pledge during that two month truce uh, their allegiance to John that he's their overlord. They no longer do that. John also has to accept that Brittany is held by Arthur from him. So, he, yes, John is the overlord of Arthur, but Arthur accepts that, uh, uh, overlord of Arthur, but actually he doesn't get control of Brittany. That Arthur is to rule that as the Duke of Brittany, having it as a vassal from John, and John's having this as a vassal from the King of France. And the other thing is that actually any disputes between um, Arthur and John are to be settled by Philip. And so actually, John does have to give up quite a lot. He has to pay 20,000 marks to inherit. He has to lose the allegiance of the Count of Boulogne and the Count of Flanders, who are at the northeastern uh, part of Normandy. That's quite important. He loses parts of Normandy like Vexin, okay? Um, although it doesn't get Las Andalies. But at least he is recognised, okay, as the rightful heir to all of the land okay john uses this peace treaty to stamp his authority on his inheritance he then goes on a tour he tours all of the lands in france he goes all the way down to gascony he goes all the way across um to la marche he goes in normandy in poitou in anglomate aquitaine he goes all over apart from Brittany, because of course that's Arthur's land, he goes all over the rest of it with an army going round, meeting the barons, getting their allegiance, getting them to pay homage to him, rewarding them if they were on his side before, to actually build up support for himself in France. But by the time you get to May 1200, John, against the odds to start with, has secured for himself the Angevin Empire by fighting and defeating Philip and Arthur and getting them to come to a truce. The second issue that we need to look at regarding John and his loss of Normandy is why did this peace that came about in May 1200 at the Treaty of Liglet, why did it end? Why did Philip and John end up going to war with each other, bearing in mind that Philip had accepted John's lands? And so what it starts with is where we left off, that John is doing his tours of his lands um, and he's going around visiting all different places, Poitou, La Marche, Gascony, Aquitaine, and while he's doing it, he comes across a place called Anglimé. And while he's there, he meets Count Iomar. Now, Count Iomar was 
a bit of a rebel. He'd been a rebel for John's brother. He had not done as he was always told. And as such, under the Treaty of La Galette, John, one of the things John had to do, apart from the 20,000 marks, apart from uh, not have the allegiance of uh, the Count of Flanders and the Count of Boulogne, he had to accept back people who had previously fought against him, fought against his brother. And one of the people he had to accept back was Count Iomar. And Count Iomar was Count of Anglomé, and he only had a daughter, Isabella. And Isabella would inherit Anglomé when Iomar died. Now, John was also, at this point, single. Having previously been married to Isabella of Gloucester, her, he managed to get the marriage overturned. Because he said, I've married my cousin. I shouldn't have married her i would i want my marriage to be annulled and so the french bishops annulled his marriage to isabella of gloucester and so john was also on the lookout for a wife and he found in Isabella a good match. A good match politically anyway. Because if he married Isabella, and he did marry Isabella in August 1200, this would bring Count Iomar under control. It would make him less likely to cause problems for John. Also, it would stop another baron, Hugh de Lasignian, from becoming too overpowerful. Because Hugh de Lasignian was the lord of the Lusignians, and the Lusignians controlled lands around Poitiers. Okay, so if you look in Poitou, you can see Poitiers, the, the Lusignians controlled land around there. Also, recently, they taken control of La Marche, which is also on the map. Now, if Hugh de Lusignian, who was engaged to Isabella, if Hugh de Lusignian actually married Isabella and inherited Anglem, Anglemé, it would give him land that was almost as big as Normandy. And for John, this was too risky. Hugh de Lusignian he didn't feel he could trust him and he thought that actually if he takes control of this he's going to get control of a large amount of land that basically will divide his land from the north and normally Anjou, Maine and Terrain from Aquitaine in the south and it wasn't worth the risk and so he had to marry Isabella of Anglomé because it would actually give him access to this large amount of land well not as large amount of land the land of Anglomé which is on the trade route and also it would stop Hugh from marrying her and he does, he marries her in August 1200. Hugh de Lusignia is angered by this. He, he, he's upset, he's humiliated that his young bride, and she's somewhere between 12 and 15, his young bride, um, who he's engaged to, has been taken by John. And so he appeals to John as his overlord and says, I have been humiliated. I want redress. And that's in 1201. And the reaction that John gives is that, okay, you want redress. You can have trial by battle. Uh, that's where you fight with somebody to work out who's right. Uh, but I'm not going to fight you because, well, I'm the king and why would I? Uh, you can fight my um, champion my champion jousters my tournament champions Hugh de la Signa is not happy about that obviously once this has happened John does two things one thing he does is he orders um, 
his officials in La Marche to start to find any excuse to cause problems for the Lusignians, uh, to upset the Lusignians, to upset Hugh de Lusignan's authority. And at the same time, he also has his officials in Normandy upset Ralph de Lusignan. Because Ralph Lusignan is the Count of Eu. Count, he's the brother of Hugh, so Hugh's brother, Ralph, who's Count of Eu, that's E-U, okay, which is a, a county in Normandy. He also orders his officials to anger him. If he'd have left it in 1201, there's a very good chance that actually nothing would come of this. Philip doesn't want another pro doesn't want a war with John in 1201. He's got too many problems himself. He's got a bigamous marriage. Um, he's under an interdict. He does not want in 1200, 1201, he doesn't want a war with John. If he'd have met Hugh de Lusignan, or if he'd have actually not had him harassed in La Marche and had his brother Ralph Larast, who was the Count of U in Normandy, it potentially would have gone his way. But he does, he has them harassed. He also calls a feudal army to meet him in Portsmouth. And when they arrive, he takes the money they've turned up with, with them, and sends them all home because he, he, he wants his money for a mercenary army, which is quite a modern idea because he realises that actually a feudal army, which is where you get uh, knights and people from all over the country turn up with potentially not the greatest of weapons, not very experienced. He realised that actually what he needs is a, a mercenary army who are experienced, who are well trained, who are well equipped. So he gets the money and sends them home. But because of the fact that he's been harassing them, in 1202, in Easter 1202, he gets summoned to Philip's court. Philip says, I want you to appear as your overlord and ultimately the ultimate overlord from Hugh de la Sigla. I want to redress this issue because you haven't redressed it well enough as his overlord. And John refuses. John refuses to meet him. And he's declared by Philip a contumacious vassal, which basically means he has broken his bond. He's broken his oath of allegiance. He's broken his homage with his overlord. And therefore, he has forfeited his lands, that his overlord can take his lands off him. And so Philip says that actually he's going to take off John, the Duchy of Aquitaine. Luckily... Poitou. Luckily for Philip, this happens at just the right moment. He's, one of his wives dies, so therefore he's actually now not got the problem that um, he's got a bigamous marriage and an interdict. Also, the Count of uh, Flanders and Boulogne, particularly just the right moment to go off on crusade. And so actually, any potential allies that John has got aren't around just as philip declares that john is a contumacious vassal and that actually he is the fourth of his land and so the war restarts and philip is going to seize his chance to finally remove john and the angevin empire from france The final thing that we need to look at in John's loss of Normandy actually is, well, his loss of Normandy. We've looked at his original securing of the inheritance. We've looked at actually uh, why the peace breaks down and why he ultimately goes uh, to war. And what we're going to look at now is actually why he ultimately loses the Arch of inheritance that he fought so hard to get. And so one of the first things that actually happens to do this is that once he's declared a contumacious vassal, uh, contumacious vassal, Philip begins to do raids into Normandy, and in particular, he's got the, the help 
of um, Hugh de Lusignan's brother, who we've mentioned before, um, Ralph de Lusignan, who is the Count of Eu, okay, which is in northeastern um, Normandy. And of course, remember, what's important is the fact that uh, the Count of Boulogne and the Count of Flanders are away on Crusade. And so therefore, this uh, Count, uh, Ralph de Lusignan, Hugh de Lusignan's brother, he works with Philip to actually allow Philip to start to get north, the control of northeastern Normandy. Whilst that's happening, Arthur leads a force from Brittany. And he leads his army to Mirabu. Okay. And at Mirabu, John's mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, is there. John hears about this from his Senchal in Anjou, William de Roche. And he hears that his mother is actually uh, being attacked at Mirabu. So John, very quickly, he covers 80 miles in 48 hours, goes over to Mirabu. Whilst he's doing that, Philip is attacking Arquies. Okay, and Philip's attacking there as well. So John goes over to Mirabu uh, with William de Roche. He covers the ground very quickly, uh, 80 miles in 48 hours. Partly because of the fact that um, John motivates his men, but also because of the fact that actually William de Roche knows the lie of the land really well and he gives him um, the, the best route possible. John and William de Roche arrive quickly, um, far quicker than Arthur is expecting, and he actually catches them having breakfast um, and they um, take them all prisoner. And so John gets control of Arthur, he gets control of his mother Constance, he gets control of of, um, well, no, he doesn't get control of Constance, because Constance by this point, sorry, is dead. He gets control of Arthur, he gets control of Hugh de la Signia, he gets control of uh, Geoffrey de la Signia, he gets control of around 200 rebels. The leading rebels, John gets um, and takes them to Normandy. The other other rebels that actually aren't that important, he then ships off to England to Corfe Castle. And so at Mirabu in August 1202, John and William de Roche capture the leading people. Now, in theory, this should end it because John has got the leaders. John is actually now in a position of, well, uh, is in a strong position. Such is a position that Philip then calls off his attack at uh, Arquies because he thinks, Do you know what, actually, John's regained the upper hand here. And then John. Makes a mistake. Quite a big mistake. And the mistake that he makes is that actually, despite the fact that William de Roche has been um, a very good ruler of Anjou for John, despite the fact that actually um, de Roche has helped him to get control of Arthur in the past, despite the fact that actually de Roche helped him rescue his mother. John feels that he needs to clip de Roche's wings. De Roche is married an heiress. And he feels that now, as he's got the leading prisoners under control, and Philip has called off. Now, if, the, if there's going to be any time to deal with DeRoche, he doesn't believe he can trust his loyalty. Now is the time. So what he does is that he moves Arthur um, to the castle at Falaise. Um, and that's out of William de Roche's care. William de Roche has had an agreement from John previously that he will be responsible for guarding Arthur. And that's important because therefore actually that gives him the prestige, but it also gives William de Roche the chance for any ransom money in the future. Arthur's most Falaise annoys William de Roche. William de Roche thinks that he can't trust John. He thinks that John actually um, has gone back on his word. And he switches sides and he goes back to Philip. But he takes with him and persuades Amory Thoir. So the man who actually was when in the first, well, in the first war when John is trying to secure his inheritance, and you've actually got the, the actual Senchal of Anjou is uh, Peter de Roche. 
sorry, Peter Roche, William de Roche, not Peter Roche, William de Roche, and he's the actual Saint Charles Anjou. Um, and John sets up Amy Thoise as the as, as a sort of like the the shadow one. Well, when de Roche goes, he takes Amy Thoise with him. And so these two leading figures switch over to Philip's side, which gives them uh, some much needed motivation, some much needed uh, enthusiasm. Also, John makes the mistake of Arthur's disappearance. Now, we don't know how Arthur died. Historians generally agree that he did. But whatever the, the whatever happens to Arthur, whenever Philip says produce him, he can't. And rumors start to spread around that, that John has had Arthur killed, or Arthur has killed John himself. And that's the Bretons become incredibly angry. And it just this murder or potential murder, along with the switching aside of William de Roche gives the ejection to Philip that he needs. Because actually, well, with Arthur's death, John's main pawn in his move, in his movement, uh, his chess game with Philip has gone. And so John realises that he's got to actually try and regain control of the situation. So he releases some prisoners. He releases Hugh de Lassignan. Uh, he, re he releases others. And part of their, he releases Hugh Lebrun. Part of their release deal is they actually have to give hostages for their good behaviour. Um, and most of them, apart from Savary de Million, actually, as soon as they're released, on oath, um, they go back on their word. So Hugh Lebrun, Hugh de Lassignan, released on oath, that they're going to rule on behalf of John. They're not going to cause any problems. They go back on the word. The only one who doesn't is Savary de Million. And so with the rumours of Arthur's death spreading, with the release of prisoners, okay, which has gone wrong, and with the rumours coming to France that actually, well, the... Uh, hostages that were taken, um, the prisoners who were taken, sorry, during Mirabu, who went back to Corf Castle in England, actually 22 of them have been starved to death there. It starts to create a... It starts to create a feeling that John's probably going too far, that actually we don't want to support him anymore. And this feeling of treachery starts to spread. For example, uh, John hears uh, that his wife um, has been, well, his wife is, is being besieged at Shinon, at the castle at Shinon. He's there with the mercenary army. He, on his way to doing that, um, he finds out that a lot of the barons that he thought he could trust, the French barons, are switching sides. For example, the Count of Alacon. Okay, the Count of Alacon in spring 1203, whilst he's on his way to go and rescue his wife at Shinon, switches sides. And so John starts to feel that he can't trust the French barons. And so he starts to rely on mercenaries and this only adds to accelerate the views that the french barons have got their dislike of john and it's accelerated by his reliance on foreign captains such as loopscar who's nicknamed the wolf and other mercenary captains like gerard de athy uh loopscar to give you an idea about what the sort of things they're doing is they're going around um, using extortion. One of the people that he gets extortion from, so where he's basically making them pay money on threat of violence, is the abbess of Khan, C-A-E-N. So actually, the people that John is appointing are popular, and this is adding to people deciding they're going to support Philip instead of him. And so when Philip starts to move to castles such as beaumont le roger or Vaudreau Castle, which are um, castles that are part of the chain that um, protect Chateau Gaillard, when he arrives at these castles, even though these castles are 
well defended, well resourced. Both Beaumont Roja and Vaudreuil Castle surrender without a fight. By and large, they just surrender even though they could defend themselves. Because of the fact that commonly it's viewed as that, that people no longer support John in France. That the French are no longer really on John's side. In August 1203, Chateau Gaillard is besieged because of the fact that Arthur, sorry, because of the fact that Philip has got control of Beaumont and Raja and Vaudreuil, and they've surrendered without a fight. He then begins his siege of Chateau Gaillard. Um, and John doesn't take this line down. He arranges an audacious um, counterattack with William Marshall leading a force on land and a force coming along the River Seine, and that these two forces are going to arrive together and they're going to take out uh, the besieging army. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. William Marshall arrives and the army on the Seine don't get there in time because of the currents. And so the relief is called off. In December 1203, John's got every reason to think that Chateaugard can hold out. It's well defended. It's held by a loyal commander, Roger de Lacer, and he thinks that actually he can rely on it to hold out through the winter of 1203. He, Before he leaves, he strengthens Rouen's defences, um, and he also prepares um, potential landing sites in Normandy for when he returns. And so he goes back to England. He's going back to England to raise more support and more money that he needs to push back against Philip. He's not leaving Normandy. For example, in January 1204, he gets from the Great Council a scootage. And he also gets a granting of a tallage. Both of these taxes, scootages and tallages, okay, um, tallages are tax that's levied in the towns. Um, both of these taxes that are granted by the Great Council are to provide funds for the retaking of Normandy and pushing back. In March 1204, he's starting to put together the force that he's going to have to go back to France at this, uh, once the weather improves. And he hears that Chateau Gaillard has fallen. He then gets more bad news that actually in April, his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who's helped take control of the south of France, the Duchy of Aquitaine, dies in April 1204. And so John realises that there's not really any point him going to France because there's nothing to actually use the springboard to go back on. And then in June 1204, Rouen finally surrenders. For John, this is not the end. He feels that he's got the resources that the next year he'll be able to go back and to retake what he has lost. But one of the reasons why he loses, has lost it, and this is a matter of debate amongst his stories, but one of the reasons often he's given is financial. Historians talk about the fact that actually John is struggling to bring in the money that he needs. First of all, from his own land. Remember, the land that a king has themselves um, and that they live off uh, is called a demens. And that actually the money he's getting from his demens land within England is limited. That actually because it's farmed out, so his demens land is given to sheriffs um, to rule on his, well, rule to run on his behalf and that uh, they pay him a fixed amount of money for it and then they get to keep the rest actually because the amount of money they're paying the king the sheriffs to farm the demands land is was fixed in john's father's reign the inflation is basically making this, this money that they're getting um that he's getting in worthless because the sheriffs because they're farming uh the demands land um both literally and technically uh, for John, they are able to raise the money that they get. And yet the income that John gets from it is fixed, it's fixed in his father's reign. So John's not getting as much money from his demands land. Um, and so this reduced money hits 
watch on this pay because the costs are going up with the inflation and he can't afford to do it scootage for example um in 1200 he raises it from one mark to two marks but the scooters in 1200 in those bringing in two marks actually john needs three marks to be able to pay for the mercenary army that he needs so he always getting two marks in 1200 when he raises it from one to two it's not getting the three that he needs and so john is really struggling he's not getting the money for the demands land because of inflation because of the fact that it's um it has been farmed out to sheriffs who are paying a fixed amount of money the fact is that he hasn't got as much demands land he's only got two-thirds of the demands land that william the conqueror has got and the scootage isn't bringing in as much money yes he's getting fines from scootage uh if they don't turn uh, if the people do not show up or uh show up when a feudal uh lev well when a, a, a feudal army is called they can pay fines uh between three to ten marks although he's getting that the inflation is eating into it scootage isn't bringing in enough and england is also struggling to pay anyway um england's finances are shaky people are reluctant to pay more money uh for example they had to pay for richard's ransom uh, a few years earlier when he was kidnapped on the way back for crusade and that cost england sixty-six thousand pounds the country was had paid for sh the building of chateau Goyard, which was eleven and a half thousand pounds and all this together some historians think that actually john only had around 71 74 percent of the income that philip had and so actually that it was the money that was the reason that ultimately john lost normandy is what some historians believe but they don't all agree yes yeah, far as john was concerned when he lost control of normandy and he lost control of large parts of aqua uh, well, large parts of Aquitaine um, and large parts of Poitou and Brittany and all around there as far as John was concerned this was temporary next year he was going to come take it back